This video is made possible by Curiosity Stream and Nebula. Watch another brand new episode in my monthly, ongoing modern conflict series on Nebula that covers the many recent wars and conflicts of the 21st century, with 15 full-length episodes already uploaded ranging from Russia's many conflicts in Ukraine, Transnistria, Georgia, and Chechnya, to the US-Iran conflict, Greece-Turkey conflict, and many more with brand new episodes coming out every month, all of which you can access by simply signing up for the Curiosity Curiosity Stream Nebula Bundle deal for less than $15 a year at curiositystream.com slash real life lore. This is David Beasley. He's the man who currently runs the United Nations World Food Program, the largest humanitarian organization in the world that is focused on global hunger and food security. Listen to what he has to say during this speech back from February of 2022 while speaking about impoverished countries around the world. So these are the countries that are struggling in such a way that if we do not address immediately over the next nine months, we will see famine, we will see destabilization of nations like you are already seeing in certain places like in the Sahel. And third, you'll see mass migration. And I can tell you from experience, we've got the solutions. We've got the programs. We need the money and the follow through. Otherwise, nations around the world will pay for it a thousandfold. Mr. Beasley was commenting on a global food supply problem back in February of 2022 that was already in a very bad shape for a very long list of reasons. In China, a series of catastrophic floods across the previous summer in 2021 damaged more than 30 million acres of farmland across the country, leading the Chinese agricultural minister to announce that their winter crop yield could end up becoming the worst in history. The La Nina meteorological condition over the Pacific Ocean that began back in 2020 was persisting into an unusually long third year, bringing less precipitation than usual across the American West and dramatically exacerbating the already worst drought that the region has seen any time in the past 1,200 years, from California to Western Kansas, and seriously negatively impacting U.S. agricultural output in the process. Eastern Africa is currently experiencing the most severe severe drought there of at least the past 40 years. In August, the Taliban's recapture of the government in Afghanistan had plunged the country into an even worse food security situation as financial sanctions from the West began to bite, while internal civil wars continued to rage across many of the countries in the Middle East, from Syria to Yemen, negatively impacting their citizens' abilities to acquire food. Back in 2020, in the capital and biggest port of Lebanon, Beirut, a catastrophic warehouse explosion took out most of the country's huge grain silos, leaving the country without any ability to store large amounts of grain and forcing them to become heavily reliant upon regular grain shipments coming in by sea instead, largely from Ukraine and Russia. And the lingering supply chain bottlenecks of the COVID-19 pandemic were still hampering the world's ability to ship products, including food. Largely because of all these issues, the numbers of people around the world whose access to food is so poor that it directly threatens their livelihood increased by nearly 80% over just the past five years, from 108 million people to 193 million. So, as you can see, the global supply chain of food was already under a lot of stress when Mr. Beasley publicly announced his warnings of famine, instability, and mass migrations around the world over the next nine months at the Munich Security Conference on the 18th of February, 2022. And then, just six days after those warnings were made, Vladimir Putin ordered nearly 200,000 Russian soldiers to invade Ukraine. And the global food situation immediately went from bad to absolutely catastrophic. Before the invasion began, Ukraine was among the world's most significant agricultural powerhouses, ranking fifth in global wheat exports, third in barley exports, third in corn exports, and first in oilseed exports. Blessed with an abundance of some of the richest and most fertile black soils found anywhere in the world, across the vast Eurasian steppe that spans throughout southern Ukraine and Russia, these two countries have been among the world's top agricultural powerhouses for hundreds of years. Ukraine alone provides nearly 9% of all the wheat that's traded in the world, and 
When combined, the food that is grown upon these rich fields in both Ukraine and Russia supply nearly 30% of all the wheat that is traded across the world, 20% of the traded corn, 75% of all the traded sunflower oil, and nearly one-eighth of all the calories that are traded globally. An overwhelming percentage of these calories are usually delivered by cargo ship across the Black Sea and through the Turkish Straits towards countries across the Middle East, North Africa, and Eastern Africa, where the environment is significantly more arid on average. The soils are of lower quality, and the widespread production of crops is therefore more challenging. Egypt alone is the world's single largest importer of wheat, with a hungry population of more than 100 million people who largely all live immediately within the narrow oasis that the Nile River carves across the barren Sahara Desert. As a result, Egypt has one of the lowest ratios of arable land to people in the world, with even less arable land overall than Serbia, a country with nearly 15 times less people, which ultimately means that, inevitably, Egypt is a country that is heavily reliant upon importing food from other countries. The primary food staple within Egypt is bread, which accounts for roughly 30% of all the calories that are consumed by Egyptian citizens. This means that the country consumes around 21 million tons of wheat per year, and 62% of all that wheat is imported from abroad. And the overwhelming majority of that imported wheat, roughly 82% of it, all comes from just the rich black soil fields found across Ukraine and Russia. And Egypt is far from alone in this high level of dependence on food coming from around the Black Sea. The rich fields of Ukraine and Russia ordinarily supply 81% of Lebanon's imported wheat, 79% of Turkey's imported wheat, and significantly high amounts of imported wheat across the Middle East, North Africa, and Eastern Africa. This is one of the world's most crucial trade relationships that is entirely defined by geography. And it is very difficult for any of these countries who receive large amounts of Black Sea grains to find economic alternative suppliers. Other rich and fertile agricultural areas in the world like Western Europe, Canada, the United States, Brazil, India, or China are all significantly further away and have their own geographically determined trade routes already going on. And so, sending any grains from these regions to the Middle East or North Africa would consequently take longer and be more expensive when compared with the close or by fields of Ukraine and Russia. Within Ukraine itself, these were the provinces that produced the most of that hugely important food supply that fed some 400 million people around the world in the years immediately prior to the invasion heavily concentrated within the southeast, central south, and western portions of the country. However, these are largely the exact same areas of the country that have seen the most intense levels of fighting since the Russians invaded back in February. At present, nearly one-third of Ukraine's rich farmland is either directly beneath Russian military occupation or has been bombed or mined so severely that it's no longer considered safe for farming. And so to say that the war has disrupted Ukraine's usual agricultural productivity would be an absurd understatement. The war has absolutely crippled Ukraine's ability to produce and export their usual crops. For example, the vast majority of Ukraine's wheat crop is winter wheat that is planted during the autumn months between September and November, and then ordinarily harvested during June and July the following year. This entire wheat crop within Ukraine that was planted last year is therefore supposed to be being harvested right now. But half of those winter wheat fields are currently beneath Russian military occupation, or still being actively fought over, which ultimately means that a lot of the usual harvesting of this wheat crop isn't going to happen at all this year. And then, only to make matters even more severe, even if the Ukrainian farmers were somehow miraculously capable of harvesting all of their crops this year, they simply don't really have anywhere to store it because all of Ukraine's grain silos are nearing maximum capacity since they're still storing an enormous amount of grain from the previous harvest from before the war began. Some 25 million tons of grain, the majority of it corn, is still stuck within the grain silos around the port of Odessa in the southwest. 
Ukraine's primary export hub where, ordinarily, some 98% of Ukrainians' exported grains are shipped from out towards global markets. However, in combination with the military occupation and fighting over much of Ukraine's agricultural land in the southeast and central south, the Russian Navy has been actively blockading the remaining Ukrainian coastline, still under Ukrainian government control in the southwest, that includes the all-important port of Odessa. And the Russians right now aren't letting anything through it. In addition to that, fearful of an eventual Russian D-Day-style amphibious assault on the beaches near to Odessa, the Ukrainians have planted an enormous amount of naval mines within the waters immediately around Odessa to deter them. But both of these factors combined mean that Ukraine isn't capable of exporting any of their usual crops out to the global market, even if they were harvesting all of their crops. Which means that tens of millions of tons of food stored in Odessa's grain silos are likely going to begin rotting, and the next crop that is supposed to be being harvested right now will likely also rot to nothing. It's quite possible that Ukraine's total exports of food this year, which are usually in the top five globally, will end up being effectively zero, and the country could end up becoming a net importer of food this year instead if the war gets bad enough. This all on its own could end up taking out roughly 5% of all the traded calories in the world during a normal year. Which, in addition to all the other problems going on right now with the global food supply, will have disastrous consequences that will reverberate across the entire world. But will be felt most severely across Ukraine's normal grain export destinations in the Middle East, North Africa, and Eastern Africa. Now obviously, one of the biggest problems creating this whole situation is the ongoing Russian blockade of Ukraine's southwestern coast and Odessa, which isn't allowing any of Ukraine's agricultural exports to leave from port. And to make matters even still worse, the Joint War Committee of Lloyd's Insurance, one of the largest maritime shipping insurance companies in the world, has now labeled the entire Ukrainian coast and northern Black Sea a region of quote, high risk. Which basically means that insurance premiums for cargo ships operating within this area right now are sky high. In order to get around the blockade and the insurance issues, there have been some proposals made to reroute a lot of Ukraine's agricultural products from maritime shipping out of Odessa towards overland shipments by rail and truck towards the European Union, and over to other maritime ports in Romania, Bulgaria, Poland, or the Baltic states. But there's a number of problems with this idea. First of all, most of the European Union and Ukraine use different rail gauges for their railroads, which creates a man-made choke point for rail-based trade at the Ukrainian-EU border. Ukraine's entire infrastructure has been built out over decades to get their grain down to ports on the Black Sea to ship out by container vessel, and shipping it out over land to the European Union will simply not be as efficient or quick. Therefore, even the most optimistic of planners expect that the Ukrainians won't be able to get any more than 20% of their usual global grain exports out to the EU by land using rail and trucks. The vast majority of Ukraine's grain can only get out by sea through Ukraine's own ports on the Black Sea and through the Turkish Straits. But how can this be done with the Russian naval blockade? This problem has led Lithuania, a NATO and European Union member state today, an ex-Soviet republic of the past, to propose a second and far more dangerous option. They have proposed forming what they call a naval coalition of the willing, an alliance of nations that will send armed ships into the Black Sea to safely escort Ukrainian merchant ships carrying the all-important grain through the Russian blockade and out to world markets. And while risky, such an action would have some historical precedent. During the Iran-Iraq War throughout the 1980s, the United States Navy carried out the largest convoy operation since the Second World War when it agreed to escort Kuwaiti oil tankers through the maelstrom of the war-torn Persian Gulf so that their enormous oil resources would continue reaching the global market. However, that operation was rife with controversy. American escort vessels were struck routinely by both Iraqi and Iranian ordnance that almost brought the United States formally into the conflict. And then, in 1988, one of these American warships misidentified an Iranian passenger jet that was still flying within Iranian airspace and fired a missile at it that shot the plane down. 
killing all 290 civilians who were on board, an action that the US government still to this day has never formally apologized for or acknowledged any responsibility over. If the United States carried out a similar operation today within the Black Sea, similar accidents and misunderstandings can happen, except the difference this time is that unlike Iran, Russia is the world's largest nuclear power, with at least 1,500 nuclear long-range missiles ready to fire at a moment's notice. Moreover, the Russians have an absolute arsenal of anti-ship and area denial capabilities, with their numerous weapon systems stationed within the Crimean Peninsula, enabling them to effectively dominate the waters of the Black Sea from the land. Any Allied ships escorting Ukrainian merchant vessels out of Odessa have to be prepared to potentially come under fire from the Russians for violating their blockade, and in that event, the Allied ships must be willing to return fire or the entire operation is pointless. But if they do return fire, that leads to a direct military confrontation between themselves and the Russians, with uncertain but potentially catastrophic risks of escalation even further. And then there's still the fact that the Ukrainians have mined the hell out of the waters around Odessa themselves. If the convoys are going to be successful, Ukraine will have to remove most of those mines. But they aren't likely to do that because doing so would free up the amphibious invasion path for the Russians towards Odessa. The Ukrainian government has offered that they would be willing to remove the mines if the West provided them with long-range anti-ship missiles, but that remains to be seen if it'll actually happen or not. In many ways, the problem with Allied convoys escorting Ukrainian merchant ships across the Black Sea is very similar to the debate on declaring a no-fly zone over Ukraine's airspace. Is this ultimately an issue that NATO is willing to risk a direct war with Russia over? And like the no-fly zone, the answer so far has been a resounding no. And moreover, even if they did agree to help out by sending in the armed convoys, the West is severely limited in their legal abilities to send warships into the Black Sea because of Turkey's own control over the Dardanelles and the Bosphorus. The strategic gates between the Mediterranean and Black Seas that they have controlled for centuries, and through which access is highly regulated by the 1936 era treaty known as the Montreux Convention. Under that treaty, Turkey is enabled to control the passage of warships through the straits during times of war. And so on the 28th of February, just four days after the Russians invaded Ukraine, the Turks invoked Article 19 of the Montreux Convention, which blocked the passage of all warships through the straits that belonged to belligerent states, which, for the moment, has most severely affected the Russians. On the 14th of April, Ukrainian forces fired two anti-ship missiles that struck the flagship of the Russian Black Sea Fleet the Moskva, which led to its sinking shortly afterwards. This was a moment of immense historical significance, because it marked not only the largest warship ever sunk during wartime since the Second World War, but also the first time that the Russian Navy itself had lost a flagship in over a century since the Russo-Japanese War of 1905. And because of the Turks' invocation of Article 19, the Russians are presently legally prohibited from sending in any replacements for the Moskva or any other naval casualties they suffer into the Black Sea. And so their losses there are effectively irreplaceable right now. This is an obvious blow to Moscow, but Turkey has been playing both sides of this conflict since the very beginning. The Turks have informally requested that all other countries not send any warships into the Black Sea as well. And while it hasn't happened yet, Turkey is theoretically enabled under Article 21 of the Montreux Convention to officially completely shut down their gates into the Black Sea to all nations' warships if their government only claims threats of imminent danger and war. Turkey effectively possesses the legal right to deny Allied convoys into the Black Sea if they felt like it. And even if they didn't, the Montreux Convention also restricts the numbers of warships that non-Black Sea coastal states may send into the Black Sea anyway, and how long they're allowed to stay there. And thus, even if Turkey was on board with the whole convoy operation, NATO allies from outside of the Black Sea like the United States or United Kingdom would have to frequently rotate their own ships in and out of it. On the other hand, the Turkish Navy itself isn't bound by any of these legal restrictions through their own gates. 
which is why many have called for the Turks to be the ones to lead the convoy operation in Ukraine. But despite being a member state of NATO, it's usually quite difficult to predict in which direction Turkey's present government will go during a crisis like this. Because their dealings with the West, Ukraine, and Russia have all been fairly ambiguous at best. On the one hand, Turkey has sold dozens of their highly effective combat drones to the Ukrainian military in their fight against Russia, while on the other hand, they've refused to implement any financial sanctions upon Russia, and they continue to allow many of the Russian oligarchs to park their super yachts safely within Turkish territorial waters. Turkey has purchased advanced S-400 missile systems from the Russians in the past and incurred American financial sanctions in response. The Turks have allowed the Russians to build out two natural gas pipelines across the Black Sea and their own territory that grants Moscow a further ability to route their natural gas supplies around Ukraine. But then, at the same time, Turkey and Russia have supported opposite sides during the Armenia-Azerbaijan War in 2020, as well as opposite sides during the Syrian and Libyan civil wars further away from home. Ultimately, Turkey pursues whatever policy is within Turkey's own better interests at the moment. And despite being a member of NATO, they'll cooperate with the Russians whenever it suits them, and they'll cooperate with NATO whenever it suits them. And when it comes to convoys and NATO warships operating in support of the Ukrainians within the Black Sea, it remains to be seen which side they would ultimately land on. This is all ultimately why there really aren't any good solutions to fix this looming global starvation problem coming from around the Black Sea. The West blames the Russians for engineering the crisis, while the Russians are blaming the West for imposing sanctions upon them. Moscow has offered to loosen up the blockade and allow the Ukrainian grain shipments to continue in exchange for the West relenting on their financial sanctions, which they've so far refused to do, accusing the Russians of holding the Ukrainian food as a hostage in the negotiations. Antonio Guterres, the current serving United Nations Secretary General, has stated his opinion that a compromise should be made wherein the Russians agree to lift the blockade in exchange for the West relenting on many of the sanctions that have been placed on Russian and Belarusian fertilizer products. But, to be honest, that seems pretty unlikely because as the Russian army continues to struggle and fails to make any big gains on the Ukrainian battlefield, their shifting strategy towards economic warfare is only likely to continue. The blockade of Ukraine's ports, from the perspective of Moscow, is generally intended to strangle the Ukrainian economy into submission by simultaneously blocking their exports from leaving and blocking most imports of weapons, food, and cash from entering by sea. The side effect of this blockade preventing critical food shipments from reaching hungry countries across the Middle East, North Africa, and Eastern Africa is, if anything, a bonus to the Kremlin's greater geopolitical objectives. Because the massive levels of instability that it's going to cause in all of these places has the very high potential to trigger another round of revolutions and mass migration that is likely headed straight in the direction of the European Union, just like during 2015. Since Europe has already taken in nearly 8 million refugees now fleeing from the war in Ukraine since the war began, millions of additional refugees coming to the continent from the Middle East and North Africa will inevitably become politically turbulent. And this is almost certainly what Putin and the Kremlin are actually banking on. They have no geopolitical incentives to actually end this blockade. And as a result, it's going to cause one of the greatest humanitarian catastrophes of the 21st century. And then, to make this horrific situation even worse, further problems around the world since the invasion began have added even further fuel to the already raging fire. Fertilizer worldwide is currently in a short supply for a number of factors. Fertilizer production within the United States last year was hurt tremendously by the Great North American Winter Storm in February that became the costliest natural disaster in American history as it devastated states from New York to Texas and caused nearly $200 billion in economic damages. Hurricane Ida that struck the coast of Louisiana later on in August caused even more devastation, adding a further $75 billion more in natural disaster-induced economic damages to America for the year and disrupting America's production of fertilizer even further. 
Then, China, the world's third largest exporter of urea, a critical raw material that's used to create nitrophosphate fertilizer, completely banned all of their urea exports back in December in the wake of their zero COVID lockdown policies. And then, following the Western sanctions placed upon Russia after their invasion, Moscow decided to retaliate by suspending all of their own fertilizer exports, which is pretty bad for the global market, because of the three main types of industrial fertilizer, Russia ranks in the top three biggest global exporters in all of them. Back in 2021, a total of 25 countries worldwide imported more than 30% of their fertilizers from Russia alone, and they probably won't be getting any of that supply this year. All of this has contributed to a skyrocketing price for fertilizers worldwide, which has inevitably made the process of farming more expensive for farmers across the world and will decrease global crop yields this year. And then, in India and Pakistan, the most severe spring heat wave seen in the subcontinent in more than 120 years struck in March, bringing drought and rainfall levels only a quarter to a third of normal. This historic heat wave struck during the final weeks of the wheat growing season in India, killing many of the plants before they could actually be harvested. And as a result, and in addition to the skyrocketing prices of wheat and fertilizer owing to the fallout from the war in Ukraine, on the 13th of May, the Indian government, which is ordinarily the world's 10th largest exporter of wheat, imposed an almost complete ban on the country's wheat exports, with minimal exceptions. There are currently 26 countries around the world that have now issued serious restrictions on food exports, including the Russians, who partially banned their own wheat and corn exports following the Western sanctions. In total, all of these export restrictions combined from these 26 countries are currently restricting roughly 15% of all the calories that are normally traded worldwide, which I cannot stress enough will become a absolute catastrophe if it isn't resolved very quickly. There are some creative methods that have been proposed that could help solve the problem, but they all have a number of associated cons. While increasing the supply of food this year is going to be very difficult, perhaps it would be easier to ease off of the demand. For example, roughly 10% of all the grains grown worldwide are currently being used to produce biofuel, and roughly 18% of all vegetable oils are used to produce biodiesel. Demand for biofuels have exploded recently as many countries around the world have tried to find alternatives to fossil fuels, but their production is having a huge impact on the availability of our finite and stretched food supply to feed the world right now. According to Grow Intelligence, a data firm specializing in agriculture, the calories that are currently being diverted to produce biofuels could soon be enough to feed the equivalent of the annual needs of 1.9 billion humans. Temporarily overturning and repealing biofuel mandates across the world could therefore greatly lessen the blow from this current food crisis. But even more consuming than biofuels are animals. Last year in 2021, the Chinese alone imported a record-breaking 28 million tons of corn, which is more than what Ukraine ordinarily exports in an entire year, and it was all simply to feed their pigs. Nearly one-third of all the corn grown in America is simply used to feed cattle, along with roughly 40% of the European Union's entire crop of wheat. Simply cutting down a bit on the feed for the world's livestock herd for just a moment could do wonders to get us through this current food crisis. But since it would inevitably, and conversely mean skyrocketing costs in meat and dairy products worldwide, it will almost certainly face enormous backlash and difficulties. Ultimately, there presently aren't really any easy solutions to this problem, one of the greatest faced by us so far in the 21st century. And the countries that will suffer the worst are the most vulnerable and the ones most heavily dependent upon foreign imports of food, especially the ones that are usually reliant on grain shipments coming in from around the Black Sea, like all of these ones across the Middle East, North Africa, and Eastern Africa, but most critically, Lebanon, Egypt, and Yemen. 
who will each struggle to acquire alternative supplies of grain that they need to feed their populations this year. Expect that many of these countries are going to have a lot of problems and even worse instability than usual within the next nine months from when this video was posted. This is a global problem that is the culmination of both global climate change and global geopolitics. At the epicenter of the problem, however, are the geopolitical realities revolving around the Black Sea, a body of water that has caused problems for the world's food supply plenty of times in the past. In 1915, the Ottoman Empire had joined the Germans in the First World War and used their control over the Bosphorus and the Dardanelles to block all of the grain exports from the Russian Empire, which at the time included Ukraine, from entering onto the global market. This has always been the greatest weakness of these rich agricultural fields in southern Ukraine and Russia across the Eurasian steppe. But ultimately, the best and really only way to get the massive amounts of grain that can be grown on them out to feed the hungry masses of the world can be completely blocked by whomever controls the access to this choke point. The Gates to the Mediterranean during the First World War, the Allies were so desperate to break these gates open and free up the Russian and Ukrainian grain shipments that they landed at the beaches of Gallipoli near to the Dardanelles and suffered a quarter of a million casualties before retreating in defeat. And now, once again in modern times, NATO finds itself in a highly similar historical circumstance to the Entente powers of 1915. They must find a way to get Ukraine Ukraine's enormous supply of grains out past the Russian naval blockade in order to feed the world or the world will suffer a catastrophe of unprecedented scale in the 21st century. In these times, perhaps more than anywhere else in the world, the Black Sea represents the largest convergence of competing global powers, and this is precisely what makes it the most unstable and one of the most strategically important bodies of water to be found anywhere on the planet. It is at the epicenter of the conflict between NATO, the United States, Ukraine, and Russia, the largely independent ambitions of an increasingly expansionist Turkey, and the recent ambitions of China's own Belt and Road Initiative that aims to use the sea as a trade bridge from Asia to Europe. Under more normal times, a massive 898 million tons of cargo passes through the Turkish Straits between the Black and Aegean Seas per year, which is about 70% of the same amount of cargo that passes through the much more thought about and strategically considered Suez Canal in Egypt. The Turkish Straits continue to be one of the most strategically important choke points found anywhere in the world as they have been for thousands of years now, ever since the Romans first founded Constantinople. And today, they are placed immediately adjacent to the world's most politically unstable body of water. An unprecedented 10 wars and conflicts have been fought around the shores of the Black Sea since just the end of the Cold War in 1991 more than any other body of water in the world, including the ongoing Russian invasion of Ukraine, the two wars fought between Armenia and Azerbaijan over the status of Nagorno-Karabakh, the 2014 first Russian invasion of Ukraine when they annexed Crimea and started the war in the Donbass, the 2008 Russian invasion of Georgia, and the occupations of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, the previous Georgian Civil War and the Georgian Abkhaz War, and the Transnistria conflict inside of Moldova, which happens to be the subject of the most recent episode in my ongoing Modern Conflict series that I just published to Nebula, which, as you've almost certainly heard by now, is home to tons of exclusive, ad-free content from dozens of educational creators like myself, including my entire Modern Conflict series. This is a series where I upload new, full-length episodes every single month, covering recent wars and conflicts in depth that have occurred since the end of the Cold War during most of our lifetimes. My most recent episode in this series that covers the Transnistria conflict within Moldova is a very important one because it explains in depth how Transnistria came to be a breakaway state inside of Moldova, why the Russian military got involved in the first place supporting them fighting against the Moldovan government, and what that war implications mean for the current ongoing Russian invasion of Ukraine. 
There are 14 other full-length episodes in this series that I've produced with more than five hours of combined content as well that you can go and watch right now, ranging from most of the other conflicts that Russia has fought in recent times, like the ongoing Russo-Ukraine conflict, the Russian invasion of Georgia, and the Russian invasions of Chechnya, alongside other conflicts like the U.S. invasion of Iraq, the U.S.-Iran conflict, the 2020 Armenia-Azerbaijan war, along with many others. Of course, the reason why all of these videos that I've created are only available on Nebula is because of their inherently controversial subject material dealing with wars, violence, and conflict that makes them impossible to upload on YouTube without them being age-restricted and demonetized. If I uploaded them to YouTube, you simply wouldn't ever see them because this site's algorithm wouldn't ever promote them to you. But on the other hand, Nebula is a different platform, without an algorithm and without any ads. It's just a platform about great and unique content made by great and independent educational creators with plenty of other unique, exclusive bonus content from tons of other independent creators you probably already know, like Real Engineering's incredible Battle of Britain series, multiple hour-long plus documentaries from Wendover Productions, and half as interesting's hilarious travel-themed game shows. The best way to get access to Nebula and all of this incredible content is definitely through the amazing Curiosity Stream Nebula bundle deal. And with its current sales price, it's less than $15 a year to get full access to both sites. And Curiosity Stream has some phenomenal stuff that you're definitely going to enjoy as well, like Afghanistan 1979 an hour-long documentary focusing on the entire Soviet invasion of Afghanistan from beginning to end, with modern interviews from historical figures of the era like Mikhail Gorbachev and the wife of Iran's final Shah. If you want to see a documentary explaining in depth the historical trend of Russian leadership making very poor foreign policy invasion decisions, then this is the documentary for you to go and watch right now. I really can't recommend it enough, and I genuinely don't know about a better deal that exists anywhere in streaming. You get two streaming sites, both with content you'll actually watch, and all for less than $15 a year at the current sales price. But what's more, signing up will actually help countless independent educational creators beyond just real-life lore. So please make sure to do so by clicking this button that's here on screen right now, which will take you directly to curiositystream.com slash real-life lore to sign up, or by following the link that's down below in the description. And, as always, thank you so much for watching.